Ransomware clogs systems at a UK airport. New variants of ransomware are out and about in the wild. Eternal Blue continues to be used to install cryptojackers in vulnerable systems. The campaign is being called Wanna Mine. The EU considers short deadlines and sharp penalties for failure to remove extremist content from the internet. Russia is suspected in WADA and Spitz lab hacking. And did Moscow overreach with its latest Novichok disinformation effort? Now I'd like to share some words about our sponsor, Silence. AI stands for artificial intelligence, of course, but nowadays it also means all image or anthropomorphized incredibly. There's a serious reality under the hype, but it can be difficult to see through to it. As the experts at Silence will tell you, AI isn't a self-aware Skynet ready to send in the Terminators. It's a tool that trains on data to develop useful algorithms. And like all tools, it can be used for good or evil. If you'd like to learn more about how AI is being weaponized and what you can do about it, visit threatvector.silance.com and check out their report, Security Using AI for Evil. That's threatvector.silance.com. We're happy to say that their products protect our systems here at the CyberWire, and we thank Silance for sponsoring our show. Major funding for the CyberWire podcast is provided by Silance. From the CyberWire studios at Data Tribe, I'm Dave Bittner with your CyberWire summary for Monday, September 17th, 2018. A ransomware attack took departure board screens offline for two days at Bristol Airport in the UK. Airport authorities are hedging it, calling it an attack similar to ransomware. The screens were disenabled as part of a general response to detection of the attack. The airport believes the attack was speculative rather than specifically targeted. Thus, the airport believes it was simply a target of opportunity caught up as the attackers swept for systems they could reach. The affected systems appear to have been business systems. As the airport recovered, flight information was manually written on whiteboards placed around the terminal. The airport is being cautious, which is why they were quick to disconnect where they could and why remediation has been deliberate. Work is returning to normal now. The incident began to affect operations Friday. A number of evolved ransomware strains are circulating in the wild. A new variant of Dharma is out, for one. It's being called Dharma Burr, not because it's particularly chilly or chilling, but because it appends a .brrr extension to the files it encrypts. According to reports in Bleeping Computer, Dharma Burr is manually installed by hacking into remote desktop services that are directly connected to the Internet. The hackers scan for systems running remote desktop protocol, typically on TCP port 3389, and once they've found such systems, brute force the password and have at it. Dharma Burr encrypts mapped network devices, unmapped network shares, and shared virtual machine host drives. It's therefore a good idea to check permissions restrict access to network shares to users who actually need it. It's also a good idea to put computers running remote desktop services behind VPNs. There's a related development in the criminal underworld. Flashpoint reported today that they're seeing a brisk trade in remote desktop protocol access being done in dark web markets. The markets are mostly Russian-speaking, with various Russian cyber gangs doing much of the buying and the selling. And elsewhere, Ryuk ransomware is not only encrypting files, but disabling endpoint protection on infected devices. The ransomware strain, which has been in active use since the middle of last month, is said by Sentinel-1 in a Security Boulevard piece to show signs of linkage to North Korea's Lazarus Group and some evidence of dissent from the Hermes ransomware. It had pulled in more than $640,000 by this past weekend. The attackers take a high-minded approach in their ransom note. It goes something like this, quote, Your business is at serious risk. There is a significant hole in the security system of your company. We've easily penetrated your network. You should thank the Lord for being hacked by serious people, not some stupid schoolboys or dangerous punks. End quote. That last line may seem like a non sequitur, but what the attackers appear to mean is that they're not vandals, like the schoolboys and punks, but rather conscientious criminals 
who will take care of your data and deliver it back to you whole if you cough up the ransom. Researchers at security company Kaspersky Lab are following Synac Ransomware, not to be confused with the legitimate security company with a similar name. Synac evades detection with process doppelganging. And to round out the ransomware roundup, Malware Hunter team reports that Kraken Decryptor is out in a new form. It masquerades as the legitimate security tool Super Anti Spyware. The malicious file's name is close to the legitimate name, but it makes it a plural, Super Anti Spywares, with an S at the end. The best advice against all these forms of ransomware is familiar, regular secure backup. And since most of these malicious payloads are delivered by some form of phishing, suspicion of emailed links and attachments, as well as a little bit of close reading of preferred file names, can also help keep users a bit safer. Several universities in the UK, Cambridge and Oxford among them, sustained cyber espionage incidents in which sensitive technical material was taken on behalf of Iran. This is another in a long series of attempts at IP theft by Iran, as the country labors under partially reimposed international sanctions levied in response to its nuclear research and development programs. North Korea is turning in a different direction as it too seeks to evade economic sanctions. In this case, the efforts are directed at shorter-term cash flow. Pyongyang has worked up false identities that use online services to provide commodity-level IT services. They're using, according to reports in the Wall Street Journal, such familiar channels as Upwork, Freelancer, GitHub, Slack, LinkedIn, PayPal, and Facebook to facilitate sale of services and products, including mobile games, apps, bots, and other things. Much of the North Korean activity is based in the Chinese city of Chenyang, and they've succeeded in selling to Western outfits interested in saving money by buying code services from East Asia. The customers don't know the people they're dealing with are from the DPRK, and the Wall Street Journal notes, the North Korean operations have become notorious for stiffing their subcontractors. So, buyer beware. The eternal blue exploits, widely believed to have been stolen from the U.S. NSA, continue to turn up in infestations around the world. A great many of the infections involve cryptojacking. Security firm Cyber Reason has been tracking the ransomware version that's being called WannaMine. It propagates rapidly across vulnerable networks, thereby yielding a higher return than the customary pittance more conventional cryptocurrency miners now return to their controllers. The scale makes the difference. And a lot of servers remain vulnerable to exploitation through Eternal Blue. A Shodan search suggests that Eternal Blue can still have its way on almost a million servers worldwide. This is a vulnerability that can be and should be patched. The fix is available. It's just a matter of applying it. The EU advances consideration of its next major Internet regulation. Hosts will, if the measure passes have one hour to remove extremist content from their services. The clock begins when authorities notify providers. Fines would be in the GDPR range. Prosecutors in Switzerland are investigating a possible attempt to hack not only the World Anti-Doping Agency, but also the Spitz Laboratory, which has done work for the Organization for Prohibition of Chemical Weapons, an international body that's looking into the Salisbury Novichok attacks. On Friday, the Swiss government summoned the Russian ambassador and requested an explanation. The Washington Post reports that Russian disinformation over the Novichok attack seems to be backfiring, while ridicule and dismissive irony seem to have some initial small effect on public opinion. Putting the two GRU hoods on TV really hasn't worked out right. We should say, for the sake of propriety, alleged GRU hoods since Russia claims they're just a couple of regular tourists who wanted to take a quick holiday in Salisbury. One comment the Post quotes from the comments on RT's YouTube Russian version of the interviews is evocative. Quote, Until today I perceived this Skripal story as Britain's provocation, wrote the viewer. Once I saw these two idiots, my view has been shaken. Shaken, indeed. And now a bit about our sponsors at VMware. Their trust network for Workspace ONE can help you secure your enterprise with tested best practices. 
They've got eight critical capabilities to help you protect, detect, and remediate. A single open platform approach, data loss prevention policies, and contextual policies get you started. They'll help you move on to protecting applications, access management, and encryption. And they'll round out what they can do for you with micro-segmentation and analytics. VMware's white paper on a comprehensive approach to security across the digital workspace will take you through the details and much more. You'll find it at thecyberwire.com slash VMware. See what Workspace ONE can do for your enterprise security. Thecyberwire.com slash VMware. And we thank VMware for sponsoring our show. And joining me once again is Malek Ben Salem. She's a senior R&D manager for security at Accenture Labs. She's also a New America Cybersecurity Fellow. Malek, welcome back. Um, we wanted to talk today about encryption, uh, but specifically about encryption using DNA. What can you share with us? Yeah, so as you know, uh, Dave, we're dealing with increasing volumes of digital data. It's growing at unprecedented rates and storage uh, is taking a lot of space. The, the classical method of using tape to store that data can no longer keep up with the amounts of uh, data that we are producing every year. Uh, in fact, global data is expected to reach the size of 45 zettabytes by 2020. If the audience is wondering what a zettabyte is, that's 10 to the power of 21 bytes. Uh, so we need to come up with new paradigms for data storage, for data retrieval, and for data processing, and one of those possible solutions, perhaps the most promising as of today, uh, is DNA. And that's for several reasons. Uh, number one is the density of uh, DNA storage. As a matter of comparison, if we use tape to store data, eight terabytes of data is equivalent to eight million books which can be stored in 57 miles of bookshelves. Uh, in comparison to that, if you store data in DNA, you're able to store 2.2 petabytes in one gram of DNA. And that's the equivalent of 200 times the printed material in the Library of Congress. So already you can see that the classical methods uh, cannot compare with DNA-based uh, storage. And so what gives DNA that data density? Is it, is it because it's non-binary? What, what, uh, what's the trick there? It's non-binary. Uh, obviously, that's one reason. Um, uh, the other uh, reason is the way it folds. So it takes less space. Uh, so there are inherent properties in the way um, it can uh, encrypt data. You know, remember, we there are four types of DNA components. And so that provides more capability uh, to encrypt more information. Uh, but also the way it it's, uh, folds in space also provides additional capability to reduce the amount of space it uses. Now, is this something that's uh, uh, that's practical for use today, or are we still talking about something that's in the lab? So uh, it's certainly still in the lab. Um, it's practical for storing data. It's not as practical for retrieving data and processing it because it takes more time to uh, basically decrypt the data or turn it back from a DNA format into a our known digital format. Uh, so that's that's less practical, but taking data from a uh, binary format, the way we store it in, in bits today, and turning it into DNA, that's, that's very practical today, which um, basically limits the use cases for uh, the use of DNA for, for encrypting data, um, but it's certainly very useful for archiving data. And that's one of the things we're looking uh, into in Accenture, uh, in our labs, is what are the best use cases for DNA-based encryption? And one of those is obviously data archiving, uh, but also, um, you know, if you think about tracing 
uh, certain uh, components, and in particular, I'm thinking about chips uh, that are manufactured and that take so many steps to come to the, the final format. Uh, and we know that we have issues with counterfeit hardware, with counterfeit chips uh, that carry Trojans perhaps into them. It's been hard to detect those types of counterfeit chips. So if, you can, if we can use DNA to trace basically all the steps that a wafer or a chip goes through uh, as they get manufactured and store that data into a piece of DNA that gets attached to the chip, then that could provide a way of verifying um, the origin of that chip and all the information of the manufacturing process for that chip, and it's attached to it, so it goes with it regardless where it goes. So that could be another use case for the use of uh, storing data into DNA. Now, how about resilience? So does it does it hold up if in in storage? Is it sensitive to temperature or uh, you know magnetic fields, all, all those sorts of things? Yeah, um, that's another um, great property of DNA, namely its lifetime. Uh, we know that wild type and disk-based data storage degrades over time and can become obsolete, uh, requiring rewriting every so much time. We know, for, for instance, that um, cloud infrastructure requires or uses a lot of energy because of the amount of uh, electricity that's required to prevent the data from degrading. Uh, DNA, uh, or readable DNA, was extracted from the remains of a horse that's about 600,000 years old. Uh, so it basically survives for a very, very long time without requiring the amount of energy that's required for storing data into a binary format. All right. Well, it's certainly interesting research. Malek Ben Salem, as always, thanks for joining us. And that's the CyberWire. For links to all the stories mentioned in today's podcast, check out our daily news brief at thecyberwire.com. Thanks to all of our sponsors for making The Cyberwire possible, especially to our sustaining sponsor, Silance. To find out how Silance can help protect you using artificial intelligence, visit silance.com. And Silance is not just a sponsor. We actually use their products to help protect our systems here at The Cyberwire. And thanks to our supporting sponsor, VMware, creators of Workspace ONE Intelligence. Learn more at VMware.com. Don't forget to check out the Grumpy Old Geeks podcast, where I contribute to a regular segment called Security Ha. I join Jason and Brian on their show for a lively discussion of the latest security news every week. You can find Grumpy Old Geeks where all the fine podcasts are listed. And check out the Recorded Future podcast, which I also host. The subject there is threat intelligence, and every week we talk to interesting people about timely cybersecurity topics. That's at recordedfuture.com slash podcast. The CyberWire podcast is proudly produced in Maryland out of the startup studios of Data Tribe, where they're co-building the next generation of cybersecurity teams and technology. Our CyberWire editor is John Petrick, social media editor Jennifer Ivan, technical editor Chris Russell, executive editor Peter Kilpie, and I'm Dave Bittner. Thanks for listening.